going to come and present his ministry to us. Well, good afternoon. It is a pleasure and a joy to be here with you all, a real privilege. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk a little bit about what the Lord has called us to do. Um, and so, just out of curiosity, a uh, show of hands, who has been to, to England or to the UK? Yeah? Oh, okay, okay. All right, so I usually start off with a quiz. Um, and so I have high expectations here. Uh, uh, so yeah, I have, I have a few questions for you, just to test your, your knowledge. Uh, we, we do love trivia in the UK. We love a quiz night. And so here, let, if, the, if, the presentation, if the presentation is ready, we'll start off with the first question. Well, there, there's London. That's where, that's where we uh, minister right now. First question being... Go down, sorry. Other way. Number one. How many countries are in the UK? I, I have got four and five. We have, we, we have, okay, okay. Can we name them? England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland. This is a big point of contention, so we have to be clear here. Uh, the Republic of Ireland is not part of the UK, uh, so they are, uh, they are outside of it. Uh, so there are four countries inside the one country. Um, they, are all, they all have what is called devolved governments in that they all have a, a government in its individual countries, but then they have a central government uh, that meets in London at, at uh, if I go back, if I'm allowed to, yeah. That meets in, in London. Actually, it's, it's down here somewhere uh, at, at Westminster. So, okay, that was question number one. Number two, what is the London public transport system called? The tube. Well done. Okay. Two for two, some of you. Number three, about how many languages are spoken in London, if we were to guess? Just, all right, Pastor Walker says one. It's not one of the options. All right. Can we, who says A, B, C, D? It is D. Actually, it's over. It's over 300 different languages. So, all right, here's one. Which U.S. state is closest in size? To England, just to England. All right, I have New Jersey. Okay. North Carolina. We got it. That is that is that is correct. Okay. Oh wait, hold on. That that was not. You weren't supposed to see that answer yet. Okay. Also, I'll, I'll I'll tip my hand here. But North Carolina to England is the closest kind of geographically square mileage. And the next question, I've, I've messed up my PowerPoint. Uh, which states are closest in population to England? Okay, Cali California and North Carolina. And what was the last one? And Washington. Okay, so North Carolina has a population of about 10 million. That is just kind of the population of central London. Uh, once, once we go outside of that and add the rest of England and the uh, greater London, it's at 56 million. So that's California, everybody in California, everybody in North Carolina, everybody in the state of Washington packed into the area of North Carolina. So we get to know each other quite well. Yeah, there was, there's it, sorry. What percentage of people would you imagine attend church, any church, on a Sunday? Yeah. It, a, A, B, C, D. It's D. It's, it's D. It's, it's less than that, actually. It's less than that. Um, and our last question here, uh, what is the fastest growing world view? The fastest growing world view. So we were talking about world views this morning, okay? 
uh, in, in the UK, which one is growing the fastest? All right, who says A? No? B? No? C? Okay, and D. All right. So Hinduism is a large, uh, is, is a large population in certain pockets in England. So where we lived, I'll, I'll, I maybe will show you a few pictures. Um, in West London, for the first five years, it was in one of those pockets. Uh, where it called in South Hall Hayes, large population of Hindu that live there. And so we saw a lot of them. But when you spread out, it's not that huge of a population. Islam is growing, is growing. And again, it is in certain pockets, usually in urban centers. So in London, there are several uh, areas that are very, very Islamic. Christianity has declined from 14% in the last 10 years. And that was, so this is from the census in 2021, and that was a decline, that was a decline of 14% after a decline of 25% between 2010, uh, the, from the last census in 2011. So it is, it's, it's dropping. The one that's growing the fastest is, it is the nuns. It is the uh, secular mindset that there is no real truth, there is no real, uh, there, it's all relative, it's what you want to believe, and whatever you feel, whatever you think, and whatever you, you believe is right, that's fine for you. Um, but this is, this is where we're at uh, in the UK, this is where we're at in, in, in Western society as a whole. So, uh, just some fun questions. We are uh, the Gibbons family, my name is Clay, my wife, Danielle, is here, and we have our youngest, uh, Edward. Our older three were here this morning, but they are off with, the, uh, with grandparents uh, this evening since we're home just for a, a short few weeks here. Uh, they're spending time with family. And we are in London. We've been there for six and a half years. Um, I am from North Carolina. I grew up in uh, just north of Pinehurst, so just west and south of here, um, and that's, I was, I was saved in a little Baptist church um, through vacation Bible school. So my, my family uh, were not Christians, and they, my dad was working for uh, a guy who invited us kids to come to vacation Bible school, so I'm excited to hear that you guys have that going up, going on. So I was seven years old when I came in, and I heard the gospel, and the Lord saved me. Um, it was the very first time I heard it, and it was from, we joined that church. My, my parents became believers. We joined that church. We grew up in that church. The Lord called me to ministry from there, trained, and uh, then we ended up in the UK. And so we've been there for six and a half years, and I just want to uh, share with you a little bit about our ministry, and it's mostly what we have done and then a little bit of what we ha are planning to do. We are missionaries with the Gospel Fellowship Association out of Greenville, South Carolina, I think you're familiar. I just want to structure my presentation this evening around um, the model for our organization, which is this. Maybe. It is the Great Commission and the Great Commission cycle. So maybe you have seen this graphic if you've looked at our website at all, but this is how we see the Great Commission uh, being played out in Scripture and how we uh, feel called to, to interact in our, where the Lord has put us. So it starts with, up here at the top, it starts with local churches. Local churches who have the gospel are burdened with the gospel, sharing the gospel in their local areas, and partnering with and sending out gospel workers to areas who do not have the gospel. They go... And that first step is passionate evangelism, engaging the community where the Lord has called them, uh, whether it be in London or whether it be in China or Australia or in Ghana or wherever it might be, engaging that community with the good news of Jesus Christ and preaching it to them passionately. And by God's grace, seeing some of these who hear, receive the word and believe. Repent and believe. And so from there, it goes to intentional discipleship. It's taking some of those that have believed that good news and sharing with them the rest of the faith, building them up in the word, 
and seeing them added to a local church. Local church is central to what we do. It is all about the local church, and because we see that central as the central organism in our scriptures in the New Testament. And so seeing these new believers added to the local church and discipled, and from them, from them, developed into leadership. So seeing those, some of those who have been saved or who have come along as, as young believers or, or new believers and been discipled, and, and now they've been trained and helping, helping them move along into leadership where they can take uh, some, of the, some leadership responsibilities in the church. And the church then becomes indigenous is the word that we would use or autonomous. So it becomes not an American missionary's church, but the church is reflective of that place. Uh, wherever that might be. And then that church is now here and is ready to, to start sending out gospel workers. So this is a great commission cycle. And so I just want to share a few things with you about how the Lord has enabled us or, or uh, done this uh, in the UK in our, our time there. Um, so we started out in ministry in 2018 with this church, Salem Baptist Church in West London. So if you have been to the UK, chances are you've been very, very close uh, to this church because Heathrow is right here. Uh, and so you're, you're just, just outside of Heathrow. Um, and we were there. Oh, oh and this just a little, little bit is for the children who are here. Um, before we get into some of the other things. Uh, so I asked my kids what their favorite things were about our, our life in the UK, uh, where we live. And so Eloise, our oldest, without a, a second's uh, thought, says it's our dog. Um, <laughs> that's our dog, Drayton. And Drayton is part of our, our family. He's with some friends right now over there. And he is part of our ministry because uh, many people there... Uh, love dogs more than they love people. And so uh, they'll be happy to talk to you if you have a cute dog like this one. So Drayton is her favorite thing. Our son, Emery, uh, loves music and loves sport. And so I don't have his ice hockey pictures up there, but he plays ice hockey and he's part of a music school. Um, as he enjoys some of our adventures that we have, when we have opportunity to go outside of London to the seaside or to a castle, that was his favorite thing. And Eddie just enjoys being Eddie right now. He does. <laughs> he's, he's just a happy guy. Uh, and so this is where we began at Salem Baptist Church. And this is where we were able, by God's grace, to start passionately evangelizing. Now, I'll show you two ways that the Lord uh, opened doors for us to do that. First was through our school. We, for the first four years that we were there, we were part of a local school that was a Christian uh, in name school. Um, and so the children were, it's a primary school, so it's younger age. And so they were going there. Danielle began working there. I went on later to help in the governing, kind of the leadership side of the school. And uh, since it was a Christian school in name, it's a government-funded school. So they have, this is, it, the school system there is a little bit different. But they had assemblies uh, where they would get the children together and they would allow people to come and teach them about Christianity. And so we were able to jump in on that. And then they were celebrating this, this is kind of crazy. But the head teacher said to us, she wants to have a Bible week. Uh, would we like to participate in that? And we said, yes, of course we'd like to participate in that. And we were able to go over that week for uh, two or three years that we were uh, there at that school. Um, and they had the Bible, the Bible week and give every child a gospel storybook, which takes one of the, the gospel stories, uh, one of our Bible stories and and beautifully illustrated and uh, contains the gospel message with it. And so we were able to give it all 200 some children a gospel storybook for several years. That the, and I was able to go and teach there uh, several times that week and then throughout the year be able to share the gospel with these children and with all the staff that were there and to engage them with the good news of Jesus. That was one way. Um, the second way uh, was just through getting to know people in our community and helping them when they were in need and sharing the good news with them. So this is uh, Agnes and Batan. So they were connected to our church through her husband, uh, James, who tragically uh, passed away back in 2019. 
And uh, she was not a believer at that time. And it was a, he, he passed away suddenly. And at that point, our church um, was able to really come and rally around her and share the gospel with her and help her because she was now a single mother with this uh, young boy. And over, over time, and as we share the gospel with her, she came to believe. And she joined the church, and her life has been transformed by the good news. And she has really become one of the most faithful members there, and her son is involved there. And it's amazing to see where she was in 2019 uh, to where she's at now and what the Lord has done in, in growing her and uh, maturing her in her faith. So that's that first step. The second step is intentional discipleship. So taking some of these that the Lord has provided uh, that have come to faith and teaching them uh, all things so whatsoever I commanded you, filling out that great commission. So what that looked like for us is uh, we had several different youth outreaches that we did. So this is one of our young people named Abby that came to our Bible club. We did uh, different things. We teach the scriptures. We play games. Of course, we have lots of sugar. Um, which I, I appreciated this morning. Our kids were greeted with cookies and lollipops. So, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, so there's one of our, uh, there's one of our uh, outreaches. Uh, discipleship, another uh, way that we have been able to do that is with a few young men, this one in particular, uh, whose name is Majid. Majid came to the UK uh, just a, a few months before we did as a 15-year-old boy uh, fleeing Iran. And he came and was put into the, the system there, which offers no oversight but lots and lots of freedom and some finances uh, to go along with it. And it's a, it's a dangerous position for a young man to be. Um, but he was searching and he, was, uh, he came to Salem uh, Baptist Church where we were at at the time and we instantly uh, connected with him and we started Bible studies with him. He, he was a believer at that point, although he did not know very much. Um, and so over the years, we have continued to do Bible studies with him and to see him grow in the Lord. Um, he's just very eager and a very uh, solid young man growing up there. Uh, and more youth work that we, we did. This is a young man named Emmanuel, who was really the core of our youth group uh, when we started it there at Salem. And to see him continue on, he is, this is a couple years ago now, he's much taller, um, about, to get, about almost ready for university. Um, and he was really just, he was the one in the youth group that was so vibrant and excited about the scriptures. And so we started with just two or three young people, and it grew to about 15 when we, when the Lord moved us on uh, from Salem. So there's another picture of the youth group. And uh, one of the big activities for us uh, throughout the year with our youth group is we partnered with an, uh, a Christian camp that is, we, you kind of run it for the week. Um, so it's called Yellow Camp, and we go to Wales. And so here's a picture of us, uh, the camp in Wales. It's all under canvas in, in, in these tents. And that's what it looks like most of the week, because this is Wales, and it rains all the time. Um, and there we are, uh, just a few pictures here from camp. Just, uh, we, the, we eat outside. Uh, for the past few years, Danielle has been the, the lead uh, in the kitchen. So we have about 100, 100, so this year will be about 125 people coming to camp. So she leads all the cooking for that. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great opportunity because the kids that come to camp with us, where we were located in West London, some of them, the, they had never been outside of London before. And so we drove them five hours away to Wales, and the camp is in the middle of a sheep field, and it's just a huge uh, experience for them to be outside of the lights and the sounds, and then to be surrounded by Christian people, to hear God's Word being preached and have opportunities to talk about it. It's really transformative. I'm, it's, it's been a great part of our, our ministry there. And we have a slip and slide, of course. Uh, and there we are with one of the groups that we took, I think this is two years ago. <coughs> Thirdly, then, is leadership development. Um, so the ways that we have seen the Lord open doors for this is mainly through our, our church at Salem, a young man uh, named uh, Tao. Uh, Tao is a Sikh convert. 
So he came to the faith in about 10 years ago or so in his early 20s. And he has been kind of bounced around from church to church until he found a faithful Bible preaching church. And that was at Salem. And so we have been working with him because in the past three years he has felt uh, the Lord calling him to preach. And so I met with him uh, several times and helped him develop messages and talk with him often right now because we've moved away from Salem, which I'll get to in a second. But he is, uh, we're continuing to help him pursue ministry. Yep. Oops. Sorry, I think, uh, there we go. So there he is. He's preaching in one of our uh, services there. Um, other, well, this, this fourth step is then seeing the church grow to the point where it is in, indigenous is our word or autonomous, where it can stand on its own. And so we were at Salem for five years. It was always going to be a temporary uh, arrangement. We, we said three and we gave them five years in the end with COVID mixed in there. Uh, and it was our hope to come alongside the pastor there who uh, is Pastor Bill and his wife Marie. And we knew that our first term, really, we needed to work alongside some experienced uh, missionaries or experienced pastors or a pastor who could help us understand the culture and how ministry would look a little different there. And so that's what the Lord opened for us at Salem. So we were with them for five years, and the Lord moved us on from there. Um, but the church went through a couple difficult times while we were there. We, we, had to, uh, we had a building project where the whole sanctuary was gutted. That was during COVID. And then we had a building project with a spiritual building project where we rewrote the statement of faith because it was very loose and it needed to be uh, expanded and, and uh, founded on God's word. So the Lord honored all those things and blessed all those things uh, as we worked alongside Pastor Bill and Marie. Other things that we did there, we did VBS, although we call it Holiday Bible Club. Um, and so this was one of ours. We have Pinewood Derby Race, where the kids came in and made cars. It was a great outreach. Um, different Holiday Bible Clubs, so here they're cooking. Um, and we hosted missionaries or, or pastors that came over and helped us with things. So this is uh, Marshall Fant out of Rock Hill, South Carolina, came over, or came over and helped us for a week. We've had different interns that have come. So this is a uh, Maranatha student, actually. Uh, she's graduating now. Abby Guerin, who came with us. Uh, she's been w two summers with us. Uh, one summer she was with us for two and a half months. And the other summer she came and helped us with camp again. There's our building project, or the decon. It was a destruction project at that point. We were. It was going to be construction later. Uh, and then, of course, our ministry at Salem was a lot of, of preaching and teaching and uh, supporting Pastor Bill while we were there. And there's just some ladies from our church. So uh, similar uh, ethnic diversity as to this area. And that was when we said goodbye to Salem. It was at the end of uh, 2022, right? Yeah, 2022. And the Lord was moving us on. And we had been praying and working uh, for about a year and a half on where the Lord would have us to go because we felt that we had some experience now and we were ready to either plant a church or help a church uh, be revitalized. Uh, and so in April of last year, we went to, uh, well, sorry, I forgot my slides. We're, this, is still our, this is still our focus. It is still the Great Commission cycle. We, we were able to see the Lord do that at Salem, and we were looking to do that in another place in London. And the Lord directed us to uh, this church uh, called Forest Hall. It was in East London. And uh, this was, we, we'd been working towards it and met, meeting with the pastor there for about a year and a half. And uh, we, is about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, we uh, returned from our furlough and we started our work there. And the Lord, through a, an odd series of events, the Lord closed the door on that ministry very quickly. Um, the pastor it just asked us to leave. And it was, a, I'm happy to talk with you about it later if you have questions. Uh, but it was, it was a strange thing for us. Um, it was almost like we had been in a car wreck, 
because we were determined that we were going this direction and we were planning on it for, for many, many months. And then all of a sudden it just came to a stop and we had to look, okay, well, Lord, where are you directing us now? Uh, because we thought this was it. And then all of a sudden, this is not it. We'd moved our family. We'd, we left our church at Salem. We left the children's school. And we were uh, living in temporary housing right uh, near the church. And then he suddenly said, you know, you need to leave. This isn't going to work out. Um, and so this was a, it was a difficult time for us. And I, I say that because I don't know you all that well. And I'm certain that there are some of you who have been in some of those situations and there was a lot of grief and, and fear and sadness that uh, went along with that. Okay, Lord, what in the world are you doing? And we thought this is exactly where you wanted us to be because there was really, there was no one, and I'm not exaggerating, there was no one at this church. It was an empty building. It was only a pastor in his 80s who was continuing to come on Sunday mornings and open the doors. Um, but for whatever reason, it's not where the Lord wanted us. And at the time, it was really difficult for us to understand. We were very hurt. Um, but the Lord is good and the Lord is faithful. And now that we're eight months, ten months on, we can, I'm actually, we're, we're thankful that the Lord has closed that door because he had something else uh, that we needed to be uh, looking at. And that is uh, this church. So when the Lord closed that door at Forest Hall, we began praying again and searching. And I, I called lots of different pastors in the area uh, asking, okay, we are ready to serve the Lord. We're ready to jump into a church plant or a church revitalization. Um, where is it that, that you know that there's a need? And we looked at very carefully at uh, planting from scratch. Um, the Americans, all of our American friends said, this is a good thing. You should do it. All of our British friends said, please don't. So we said, okay, well, why? Because there are so many churches throughout London that are just tiny little churches that just have a few people left that would love, they can't afford a pastor. Um, they don't have any youth. They don't have any resources really, uh, but they still have a building, uh, which is nothing to, uh, to decline in, in London. And they are just praying that somebody would come along. And there are, that, that's not, you may have heard that before, and that's not an exaggeration. That is true. There are churches there, many churches there that are like that. And the Lord directed us to this church, uh, East Finchley Baptist Church. So um, there we are, uh, just, we, we started preaching, I started preaching there uh, in November of this past year. And then from November through the end of March, spent time ministering to them, and then they have voted to call me as pastor. Uh, this is a, just a little church. So there's 10 members left. Um, they are all 68 or over. Uh, and so it has a great building, though, in a great location, a, whole, a family area. Um, there's not any other strong evangelical churches that are preaching the gospel in that area. So really needy, needy place. Um, and so this is our family out in front of it in, I think, in, in April, um, where right after they had called, called us to come as pastor. It is in North London. Maybe. Oh, so there we go. So this is, uh, there's, there's Salem here over by, by Heathrow. If you watched the, the, the football match, the soccer match yesterday, it was at Wembley. There, so there's Wembley Stadium. Uh, we are right, right near that in, uh, in East Finchley. Um, so it's in, yeah, just north, northwest London. Um, and so they called us to come at the end of March, beginning of April. So we've been there over the past few weeks. They had to make a slight change in their constitution before I could officially take the office of pastor. That gave us a few weeks. Um, so we decided to to come and visit family real quick uh, here in North Carolina before we officially moved and move house and move to East Finchley and to begin our work there. So we, we're going back on Wednesday and uh, we'll be moving house over the next few weeks um, and starting our work here at East Finchley. Let me see. Uh, so just a, a few prayer needs and then we might have just a few uh, questions before we have some time in the scriptures. So here, a few things you can pray for us. Uh, strength and grace for moving. 
I don't know if you've moved recently, but it's not much fun. It's a lot of work, and so we'll be moving house, uh, and so you pray for that for us. Um, we are uh, homeschooling, so this is, uh, we've decided to do this, and uh, this is the best thing for our children right now. Um, and so we're going to, we're continuing to homeschool and we're looking forward to homeschooling this next year and using that as a way actually to engage some of the homeschooling families in the area, which is a, a growing number. And pastoral, uh, pray for, for us and, and for me in particular, I, I suppose with leadership as this is a change. Uh, I was an assistant pastor, and then I thought I was going to be the pastor at Forest Hall, but that didn't work out. And so this is a, a change for, for me in, in becoming the pastor. So there are 10 people that are, make up the church right now uh, that I would, I'm going to care for. I want to love and serve and build up in the faith. So also wisdom for evangelism. It, one of the first things that we want to do is start sharing the gospel in the community. And uh, we need wisdom on how to do that. So we have teaching English classes right now. That's the only outreach that the church has at the moment. Um, and it is full. There's maybe 12 to 15 people that come every Wednesday morning to learn English. And how do we bridge those conversations? Because they're mostly Muslim women that come. How do we bridge those conversations about English to the gospel? without uh, frightening them and scaring them off. So we need wisdom in this. We need wisdom for other ways to engage the community uh, with the gospel. The, the children, uh, there's a very large Jewish population in this area. Uh, how, do, how do we engage them with the gospel? So we need wisdom for all of these things. Wisdom in mentoring. So there are a few uh, men that are, have been around in our times at East Finchley that we want to build up in the faith and start some of that mentoring relationship with. We need, I need wisdom in that learning about the people. So it's still, where we're moving is still London, but it's a different part of London. And it's, each, each area has its own character and culture. And so we just need to, we need to learn this new area and learn the people there as well. And the church members uh, get to know them so we can serve them better. You can pray also for Yellow Camp. Um, so we, I'll be, we'll be leading this year um, and Danielle will be in the kitchen. And so uh, that comes at the end of July. So we have about 75 young people all from London that are coming to, to camp in Wales. And we are able to preach to them and talk about the scriptures with them and have a lot of fun uh, out there. So you can pray for, for that. And then for continued provision for us as we serve the Lord there in London. So that was pretty quick, um, although maybe not quick enough. So if you have any questions uh, about our family, uh, about ministry, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Um, any, anything at all, really? You can ask me about which... Yes, yes, ma'am, Ms. Walker. Okay, that's a great question. Yellow, why is it called Yellow Camp? Because they have different camps at different sites, and they decided instead to do numbers that they're going to do colors. So there's Red Camp, Yellow Camp, Green Camp, Purple Camp, Silver Camp, Orange Camp. So we are Yellow Camp. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. No. The, the, yeah, yeah, she, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no. Um, so we, no, it, it's not including them. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Elmer, yes. Mm, good question. With hesitation. Um, so they, they, um, some, some, some people, especially the, the immigrants really are open to Americans, um, because typically we speak English fairly well. And so that's, uh, that's looked up to, um, and, but others are afraid of Americans. They're afraid of the ideas. They're afraid of the politics that may come along with it. Um, they're afraid of guns. They're afraid of uh, kind of the, the audacity and the confidence that Americans sometimes bring and how loud they can be um, compared to the typical British. And so, and, and some, they, they have, a, Americans, including myself, have a tendency to maybe come in and uh, take things over. And that was one of the concerns that came out later from our church 
at Forest Hall, that there were people who we didn't know that heard that an American was coming to help this church, and they got, became very, very afraid because they thought, well, that church is gone. It's going to be taken over, and it's going to be an American church now. Um, but for the most part, we are, we are received, uh, but they kind of hold their breath to see what kind of American you're going to be. Because there are Americans that come and they have some very strong views on things. It could be dress, it could be translation, it could be music, and that's what they are known as, as the American missionaries, and this is what they do. And it's, it's almost like the gospel and Jesus are taking a back seat to whatever soapbox they have. Um, so, and, and, and that's true. We, we've met people like that there. And so, they, they kind of hold their breath and see, well, how are, you, how are you going to fit in here? And Americans have a reputation, especially in, in the UK, of being very short term, coming for two years and moving on. And so that's another factor, is that they usually think they just kind of come and they do the England thing and then they, then they go back. Um, and so you really have to, to build the relationships with these people, you, you have to commit to be there long term, where they know that okay, he's not going to tell me next week that he's packing up and he's going home or going back to the States. So, Yeah, great question. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this is going back a few years when we started Deputation, but we, we were looking for opportunities to serve the Lord here at first, and we just saw the Lord close a few doors, and we thought, this is funny now, because of what I just said, we thought, let's just go to England for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so we just thought, let's just go and, and serve alongside a church <laughs> as an assistant pastor and get some experience, because that was, that's what we were running up against, is that churches here in the, in the States we're asking for, well, do you have an experience in church work? And we didn't. And so we, we said, well, let's just find a church there because we knew that there were needy churches there. Um, and really, it's, it comes a lot from my wife, Danielle, and her love for England. Uh, since, I don't know, since sixth grade, she had a love for the history, the literature, um, the culture there. And so we had, there was a fascination about it. And so we, we were interested in it. But then when we saw the spiritual need it really became, well, that's what the Lord used to call us to go. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, so we, we went and visited, and it became clear, okay, this is what the Lord wants us to do, and we need to commit to saying, okay, Lord, if this is where you want us, then we're here as long as you want us to be here. So, yeah, this is, and our, our work at East Finchley is a long-term project. We, to see that church grow to the point where it has com completed that great commission cycle, could be 20 years, could be more than that. I mean, there is a church uh, with a GFA church planter or missionary uh, that's on its second generation of missions, uh, missionary in, in, up in Scotland, where his, his father planted the church and now he's been there, his father was there for 20 years or so, and now that missionary, Mr. Bender, was there, has been there for about 20, 25 years or something. And really now it's at the point where it is established, it's solid, uh, it, can, it, it can be self-governing, uh, self-reproducing, all of those things. But it is a, it's a long-term commitment that we're making there. Yeah. Okay, will you just take your scriptures with me? I, I, this is not a missions text typically, uh, but will you turn to Psalm 2? Psalm 2, I just want to take a few minutes and encourage you with what the Lord has been using for me here uh, lately in my study of the scriptures. If we were to choose a scripture that helps us understand the times in which we live, I think this would probably be it. Um, this is the Lord's worldview, the Lord's commentary on, on all of history. Um, and, he, and he doesn't do it through a thousand page volume. He does it in 12 verses, uh, four stanzas, where the Lord tells us what is happening, his response, and what is going to happen. Uh, look at it with me. This is a Psalm of, of David. 
Um, it is, it, we don't have it, there's no title here to tell us that, but it is attested to in Acts 4. It's a royal psalm, a messianic psalm. It would have been used probably at the coronation of maybe David or Solomon. Um, and in this psalm, there are four stanzas, and each of them have a different speaker. Um, so we have the, the voice or the speaker of the world, speaker of the Father, uh, the Son, and then the psalmist or maybe the Holy Spirit. So let's look at the first stanza just briefly. It says, Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So here we have the voice of the world. What is the world saying? What is the world saying today? It is, it is this. It is this. They are raging. They are imagining and their rage and their Im imaginations, the Lord characterizes as futile. You see that in verse 1? It is a vain thing that they are doing. So the, the world today is rioting and protesting, and it is a vain protest. It is a vain rebellion. And that is what the world is doing. It is, it is rebelling against the Lord, and it is a futile rebelling, re rebellion. It is also an official rebellion. Look at verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. Verse 1, it talks about the nations and the people, and now it's the kings and the rulers. Who is it that is, are rebelling against, against the Lord and his anointed? It is the kings and the rulers, the nations. It is, it is an official rebellion. This is not some, some kind of uh, grouse, grassroots fringe outside of power thing. This is the rulers of the nations. The kings of the earth are leading this rebellion. And their target is Mashiach or the Messiah. Uh, the Greek translation would be Christ. It is against the Lord and against his anointed against his Christ that they are targeting. It is a conspiratorial rebellion. Look at verse 3. They say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let us do this together. Let's band together and work together to see this done. There's a conspiracy going on that the nations of the world, the kings and the rulers, are officially rebelling against the Lord and his anointed. And it is liberational, if that's a word. I don't know if that's a real word. But they are wanting to break out of the Lord's rules. They want to be free of the restrictions uh, that the Lord has placed. You see what, they, what, what he calls, what the psalmist uses, use, the words that he uses are bands, cords, that they're tied down, that they feel restricted, shackles or ropes. And they say, this is, this is too restrictive. This is too narrow-minded. We have to be free from this. And that is a message of the world. It is a rebellion. And this is what's been happening since nations began. If you look back in your scriptures, the Genesis 10 and the Table of Nations and Genesis 11 and Tower of Babel, that is the nations rebelling. This is what happens in Jesus' day. This is what happens in David's day. But in Jesus' day, these scriptures are fulfilled. In Acts chapter 4, Peter quotes this passage as pointing to the crucifixion. And it, Luke tells us that on that day when Jesus died at the crucifixion, that Pilate and Herod were conspiring together to see the, the anointed one, the Christ, to be killed. And it says on, the, on that day, they were enemies before Pilate and Herod, but on that day, as they conspired together against the Lord and against his anointed, they became friends as they cooperated together. But we see this in our present day, don't we? We see this as the trajectory of the world, as they are rebelling against the Lord and his anointed. As our world is rebelling against God's, God's 
um, his, his standards of behavior, his standards of belief, our world is, is trying to shirk those away, trying to break them apart. We see this with the LGBT movement, with marriage, with gender confusion, the transformation of what biblical masculinity and biblical femininity is, sanctity of life. We see this with the eco-prophets today, and, and they're preaching that what is worst about the world is actually people and their influence on, on, um, on ecology. We see this in the craziness on campuses all around, all around the world and the rise of anti-Semitism. This is the world trying to break out from the rules that the Lord has placed. We see this particularly, I think, where we are at in London with the, the difficulty that our culture has in saying that there is one exclusive gospel, that there is only one way to heaven. With all the different faiths that are present there, what they want to say is that everybody has their own way. It doesn't really matter. But that's not what the scriptures say. That's not what the Lord has, uh, uh, has said. He says that there is only one way, and it's through Jesus. And all these, other, all these other ideas, they are darkness and they are false. But how does the Lord respond to this? Very quickly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run out of time here. The Lord responds, look at, uh, this, this is second stanza. We have the voice of the world, which is rebellion. The voice of the Father is derision. Verse 4, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. The Lord laughs at this rebellion. He looks at the protest of the world going on, and he stands back, and he laughs. It's not a laugh of mirth. It is a laugh that, that precedes judgment. You know, as you see a little toddler, could have been mine today, who is rebelling against their parents and, and, their, and their, their father and shaking his fist, saying, no, and I might laugh at him because it's so futile, it's so silly to think that, there's, that they're going to accomplish anything in their rebellion. The Lord laughs at their rebellion. Then he speaks, verse 5, he shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his, in his sore displeasure. That there is, there, it's a scornful laughter because he looks at them and what the world is doing to the good creation that God has made and what they're doing to each other as, as, as man created in the image of God, as they're destroying each other, and he, he is pulling up, treasuring up wrath against them for their sin. And then he acts in verse 6. He says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. The Lord, the God the Father, has set in Zion his king, installed him, his king in, in Jerusalem. And we see this as not David, initially it was, but pointing to the greater son of David, our Savior Jesus. And then Jesus speaks in, ver in verses 7 through 9. We have the voice of the son. Just moving quickly here. And we are uh, given a, a glimpse here of a conversation between God the Father and God the Son. And look at what God the Son says. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the Lord, God the Father, says to God the Son, Today I have begotten thee. And this, uh, this passage is quoted in Acts chapter 13, uh, verses 30 through 33, as pointing to the resurrection. When, when did God the Father give God the Son life? It was at the resurrection, because God the Son is eternal. But he gave him physical life at the resurrection. And because of that, look at the authority in which God the Son has. And this is what I particularly wanted to uh, point out to you. He says in verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So God the Father acts by setting his Son as king in Zion giving him life, and then he gives to him all things. 
The, to all things belong to the Son. They're all his possession. It all belongs to Jesus. And this is what Jesus uses as the foundation of missions. In, in, in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has been given to me. And on that basis, on that foundation, go ye therefore. That all things belong to Jesus. It, all these nations belong to him. All the people, they, are, they belong to him. They are his. And he says to us, his followers, to go and to preach this good news to them because they all belong to him. The reason why this isn't a very good missions text is because what follows in the next verse. Because in this text, the, it is not the, the gospel that follows being preached to the nations, but it is the coming judgment that is talked about. That when our Savior, Jesus, returns, he is not coming back meekly and mildly to claim his inheritance, the nations. He is coming back in judgment. Look at what it says in verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Everyone who is not in Christ is rebelling against him, and they will be under our Savior's judgment. And it will be a complete and utter destruction. The text here helps us see that he will rule inflexibly. That when Jesus returns and his government is established, here's one thing to think about right now, especially. There will be no politicians. There will be no elections. The Lord Jesus will rule, and it will, it will only be his decision. And he will rule with a rod of iron, and he will dash all those who rebel against him, who are against him, in pieces. So then we have the voice of the Spirit, and it is a voice of mercy. And it's a voice of invitation. What are we to do with this knowledge, this warning of what is coming? This is where the world's at. It's in rebellion against God. The Lord has acted. He has set his king in Zion, and the, the king will return, and he will return in judgment. So what do we do with that knowledge? Verses 10 through 12 we have an invitation. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. Kiss the Son is what the invitation here is. We have the opportunity now to kiss the Son. Now, this is not a romantic kiss. This is a kiss of fealty. It's paying homage to the Son. What's, what, we're, what we're being shown here is that there's a massive battle coming. The, the, the battle lines are drawn, and there are two armies on each side. And there is like a, you know, like you might see in a movie, somebody comes out before the battle and calls to all at the other side, if you will come and you will join our side, you will be spared from the coming judgment. If you will come and you will kiss the king, if you will pay homage to him and submit yourself to him, you will be spared from the destruction and the wrath that is to come. And that is the invitation that the Spirit gives. You have an opportunity now to bow before Jesus and kiss the Son and put your trust in Him. And that's how the psalm ends. The psalm ends by saying, this is, a, this is the best thing you can do. This is the source of real blessing. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. And it is our, it is our burden to take this good news of Jesus' coming reign his death, his resurrection, and his, his return uh, to, to preach that and to teach that to those uh, there in London. It's your opportunity to do that here. And for maybe some of you who have never thought about it like this before, that you have never submitted yourself to Jesus. You have never kissed the Son. Well, today is that day where you can 
bow before the Lord in your hearts. You can repent of your sin and you can put your trust in him. You can recognize him as your savior and your master, your Lord, because he is coming again and his judgment will be quick and it will be sure and it will be inflexible. Let's pray together. Father, we are so, I'm so grateful for this passage.